I am delighted to welcome uh, uh, Peter Fraser from Operations Research to um, to the Systems Engineering Seminar here. Um, so Peter and I are, are great great mates, and uh, uh, we've been friends since uh, before he came to Cornell. Um, he's uh, worked extensively in simulation optimization, and uh, has taken that in all kinds of interesting directions with uh, optimization applications and optimization theory. Um, but he's also got these very broad interests, as you know. He's fifty percent Uber, fifty percent Cornell. So he's uh, he's 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 had a pretty quiet last few months as he's worked on this COVID stuff and Uber and his regular research. Um, I.e., he has been a crazy man. Um, but Peter deserves a, a lot of credit for the work that he's been doing. And um, rather than uh, dig into that, I think I'll just cede the floor to Peter. Wonderful, thank you very much, Shane. And it's great to, great to see you and also great to see Mike Todd who has the, the mirror image of your rock climbing background. It's very awesome. So I'm pleased to be able to present joint work with Shane and with a number of very talented and, uh, and hardworking um, other individuals. So, so I'm gonna talk about work that we've done at Cornell using mathematics in order to do something that uh, that I care a great deal about and that you know probably a number of you here also care a great deal about which is uh, fighting COVID-19. So this is joint work with the mathematical modeling team, um, PhD students listed here as well as Shane and David Schmoyes and really also the work um, represents uh, work done by, by a great number of other people at Cornell, people at, uh, in the lab that runs all of the, the tests that I'll be talking about, people at Cornell Health, people in the administration, people at Cuyahoga Medical Center. So, um, you know, I'm just a small part in the things that uh, a great number of people have been working very hard on. So let me just start out and show you, let me, let me jump to the end and show you the fruits of our labor. In the top graph here, I'm showing the number of positive COVID-19 tests per day since a pre-semester period when a, a large number of undergraduates started to come to town. Um, and then in the, actually the, the top is the number of tests and then the bottom is the, the number of new positive cases. And I'm indicating with this um, line here, the start of classes and then I'm also uh, indicating the test positivity rate averaged over the previous seven days. And so what you see is that uh, before classes started, um, before we had a, a large amount of testing, you started to see uh, some cases, cases climbing. Um, uh, and then as classes began and testing ramped up, initially, you know, as we discovered a larger fraction of the positive cases in our community, daily case counts were, you know, uh, in the neighborhood of five to 15. And then as our interventions took hold, we saw uh, daily positives drop to zero. We, there were three zeros in a row. The 16th was a one. Um, I believe the 17th will be, uh, will be a zero. So we've really done a good job of controlling COVID-19 at, at Cornell so far. So I wanna to talk to you about how it's going at other universities, how we designed the plan that achieved the outcomes uh, that I just talked about and talk about the role of mathematics, the role of operations research, systems engineering in all of that and then hopefully give all of you some inspiration for ways that, uh, that you can impact policy with, uh, the, you know, in the kinds of problems that you care about. So let me start by talking about COVID-19 at universities other than Cornell that lack the testing program that we have instituted. There's been a lot of news coverage of COVID-19 at other universities. Here I'm just you know giving you a sampling. If you have somehow uh, not been reading the newspaper uh, over the last couple of weeks, you may have missed you know the University of North Carolina needed to move 
online after seeing a cluster. University of Alabama has seen a really large number of cases. Just down the road at SUNY Oneonta, there's been a relatively large uh, number of cases found, uh, over 500 cases. Here's a map from the New York Times showing COVID cases at colleges and, and universities around the US. Um, so, you know, really, really a, a large number of cases. So why does this happen? Just want to start us all sort of on equal footing and just give some mental models for how epidemics spread through communities. So in thinking about this, I want to position things in terms of the approach followed at most other colleges and universities. So they begin by testing students when they arrive to town. Many universities do that, not all. Some do that uh, with greater efficacy than others. Then they plan to test students and staff and faculty that present to healthcare providers with symptoms, you know, cough, uh, you know, fever, these kinds of things. And then the local health department in collaboration with the health services at the college or university would do traditional contact tracing on the, on the positive cases where they would try to figure out where that person had been, who they had come in contact with, and then would quarantine those exposed, potentially exposed individuals. Let's see an animation of what that might look like. And along the way, I'll, I'll just re remind you about a little bit of the biology of, of uh, COVID-19. So here's a graph and each circle represents a person and the gray people are not infected, but they are susceptible. So if they came into contact with somebody that had COVID-19, they, they might become infected. And then this pink person in the middle, they have been exposed to the disease. So the virus is growing in their body, but it's early in the course of their infection. So they cannot yet infect other people. A day passes and this person becomes infectious. They do not yet have symptoms, however, so they don't know that they're sick. Then through the course of their day, the people that they come in contact with, you know, their roommate, their significant other, other people that they might go to parties with or attend classes with and that come into close contact with them may become infected. So here one person uh, becomes infected, then another, then another. Then after they've done a significant amount of damage and infected three other people, they become symptomatic and they go to their healthcare provider, they go to you know, student services and they test them because this other university that we're thinking about tests symptomatic people. The health department is alerted uh, and then that person is isolated so that they're in a you know, private housing with a private bathroom and they, they can't infect other people. Then the health department interviews them, talks to them about where they've been identifies the people that they've been in close contact with, typically defined in terms of something like uh, being within six feet or less of a person for 10 minutes or more, 15 minutes or more. And those individuals are quarantined. Quarantined means that we don't know that you have COVID-19, but um, there's a danger that you, that you do. And you're, you're also asked to keep apart from other people so that you don't infect them. But in this process of doing contact tracing, it's inevitable that we might miss some people. First of all, it's hard to remember everywhere that you've been and all the people that you've come um, into contact with. Second of all, if you're at a university that penalizes you for attending parties, you might decide that you don't want to let the health department know about the fact that you've been doing this thing that might get, get, get you kicked out of school. Uh, so these, these, these additional exposed people, um, they might be missed. And the problem is that then when these people become infectious, uh, they'll go ahead and they'll spread the disease across the other nodes um, in the network. So that's you know, a problem in general, not just at college campuses. Why might 
contact tracing be even less effective on college campuses? So there are several reasons. First of all, young people, because of the way the, the biology works in, in this disease, they are more likely to be asymptomatic than older individuals. On the one hand, that's actually a good thing because it means that the health, the health consequences of a fixed number of people being infected on a college campus uh, is likely to be smaller uh, in terms of the number of people that have serious health consequences than if that same number of people were infected in the general population. Um, but it also makes it so that the people that are infected are less likely to know that they're infected and less likely to report symptoms so that we can control the, the spread of the virus. Second of all, the social science literature supports the claim that young people tend to have more social interaction with other people. So their, their graph, a graph including lots of young people, is going to be more dense than a graph representing the general population. There's also some social science evidence that uh, undergraduates tend to comply less with restrictions on behavior. For example, uh, compliance with masks uh, among people in the, the age group from which the undergraduate population is drawn. Uh, that, that, um, that age tends to be correlated with a stated uh, intent to comply less strongly with uh, mask wearing. On the other hand, um, if you think about a young person in the general population uh, and a young person on a college campus, on a college campus, behavior tends to be more monitored and controlled than in the general population. If, you know, with a college student, uh, the university would often know where they live, would know um, the organizations that that student is a member of, would know what classes that student is enrolled in, and so the, that information can be provided to the health department in order to enable contact tracing. And also, uh, although we don't know for sure, there's some evidence that young, otherwise healthy people may actually be less susceptible to infection than other people, and also uh, may tend to infect. Uh, so if you, if you hold fixed the amount of contact that, we're, that they're having with somebody, they may tend to be less infectious than other individuals. They may, um, ex they may shed a smaller amount of virus from their body. So the news isn't all bad, but still, um, these considerations at the top should make us worried that the sort of standard approach being pursued by a number of college campuses may not be effective enough, uh, at least to provide robust epidemic control among their populations. So how about having some mathematical modeling in order to help us think about that? I'm going to talk about two different kinds of mathematical models. One is a compartmental simulation that is built uh, within Python that's, that's quite detailed and that was the basis for a number of decisions that were made at Cornell about reopening and about the design of our testing program. Then the second set of models are going to be much simpler models that use differential equations. And I'm an advocate for using both of these models. Uh, we believe that we can design these compartmental simulation models so that they're more accurate. And so they should be, you know, the basis for decisions. But the differential equation models are simple enough that they can be fully understood at first on pieces of paper and then eventually, you know, in your head and having a simple model that you can, you know, that you can manipulate mentally and that, you know, you can, uh, uh, is very flexible and allows you to think fast and to prioritize work that you, that you might do and, and helps you in order to, to make decisions quickly, um, where if everything needed to come from the compartmental simulation, it might just be too slow. So here's a high level view of this compartmental simulation um, that the modeling team, Shane and David and uh, uh, PhD students that I listed at the top of the presentation. So we actually have two different versions of this simulation. One that has uh, multiple, pop one, that, one that has uh, a single population and the other one um, that has uh, multiple populations or multiple groups. Let me just explain First, the single uh, single population version. 
So each individual in that single population uh, would, be, would have a state associated with them. Um, the states correspond to first their, uh, the, bi the, the biology of their disease. So um, someone might be susceptible. Uh, that, that would, those are these gray circles that I mentioned earlier uh, in the animation. They might be exposed so that, again, those were the pink circles from the animation where it means that you are, uh, you've been infected, but you're not yet infectious. Then we allow thinking about someone who is not yet able to infect others, but we can tell that they've been infected using a test, a PCR test. PCR is a chemical reaction that we use in order to assess whether someone has virus inside of their body then that person would progress to um, an infectious and detectable state when they can infect others, but they don't yet know that they're positive. Uh, and then eventually they might move to a state either where um, they have very mild symptoms or no symptoms. And then this would influence uh, the likelihood that they would go and seek medical, medical attention on their own. They'd be fairly unlikely to do that. Or they could have more severe symptoms. They could have flu-like symptoms, or they might even have symptoms that are severe enough that they might need to go uh, to the hospital. And then after um, uh, a period of time, you go to a, uh, a removed state, um, which in, in most cases would represent that you have recovered from the disease. Uh, and unfortunately, in a small fraction of cases would represent uh, uh, that, that, that the individual would have died. So these parts of the, the simulation represent progression, natural, you know, kind of the natural history of the disease. And then we also have states which represent that you've been quarantined, maybe because you are uh, quarantined and susceptible, uh, which could happen if you are a close contact of a positive individual uh, or have a false positive test. So basically you've been quarantined, but you don't have the disease or you're quarantined and, um, and have the disease. So we, you know, we have a, a big Python simulation that tracks all of this. We also have versions that uh, basically copies um, these dynamics for, for undergraduates in high density housing, undergraduates in low density housing. We model interactions uh, between those populations, uh, you know, model staff and faculty of different types, model the, the broader community uh, in Tompkins County, which is not part of um, uh, the Cornell community. Um, and this simulation produces graphs uh, like this, where the, you know, the essential dynamics are that, so the green line is the number of people in the population who are walking around, so are in one of these states, and they are in infectious. So actually it's, it's the number of people um, in these states. And so they can infect other people. Then you also have the total number of people that are infected, including the green people, but also including uh, people in quarantine. And then you have the cumulative number of people uh, that have been infected, which includes both the people with active infections and the previously infected people. And what you would like to see from an intervention, uh, for example, the asymptomatic screening that I'll talk about in a moment that we're using at Cornell, you would like to see that the the number of free and infectious people drops quickly as these people are moved from being um, in this state or these states into this state where they can't infect other people. Any questions about kind of the, the setup? Okay, so if your contact tracing isn't good enough and you have low compliance with mask wearing, or you have a lot of social interaction so that people, uh, so that infectious people infect a large number of other individuals on in any given day. This is what happens where the fraction of the population that is, uh, that has had COVID rises from a very small number. You can see it with a single infection um, up until you get to a point where you reach what's called herd immunity, where the, the fraction of susceptible people in the population is low enough 
so that the number of new infections that result from each previous infection falls below one and the, 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 the number of free and infectious people drops to zero. What we would like to do is to create interventions so that this doesn't happen and that we, you know, we nip the, we nip epidemics in the bud. So the, the Python model that I talked about is complicated. And if you live in a world where every time you want to answer a question, you need to, you know, wait an hour uh, for a result, then you end up moving kind of slowly. So to supplement that, we also think about these kinds of differential equation models. It gives, it gives a lot of intuition about what happens in an epidemic. And this is a standard thing in epidemiology. You have uh, a number S, a separate number I, and a separate number R, each of which between zero and one, which represent the fraction of the population that are in, in each of these um, each of these states. We're gonna ignore the exposed state for the moment. We're gonna imagine that people uh, become infectious immediately after becoming exposed. There's gonna be a parameter beta, which you can think about as the number of people that an infectious person uh, uh, infects per day in a population where everyone around them is susceptible. Uh, if you'd like to break it down, into thinking about close contacts that I have and then the fraction of those contacts that are infected, uh, then, then you can go ahead and do that. So there's this parameter beta. And so what that does is, um, if you think about just a, an ODE, it creates a flow from this, uh, a flow from people in this state uh, to people in this state at a rate of, um, so beta times I times S, right? Because um, this is the fraction of people that are susceptible. Uh, and then um, each sort of uh, unit of infected person infects beta other people uh, if they were all susceptible. And then we reduce that um, by, the, by, the, by the fraction of people that are not susceptible. Then people move from being in an infectious state to a recovered state. Um, at a rate of uh, at a rate proportional to gamma, so you can think about this as having an infectious period that lasts an exponential number of days uh, with a rate parameter of gamma. You can write all this down as um, as a set of differential equations where the uh, susceptibility rate you know decreases uh, the, the fraction of susceptible susceptible people decreases at this rate. Um, the number of infected people rises at the same rate, but then is, is decreased by the people moving from being infectious to, to, to recovering, and then recover the recovered people uh, uh, rise at, um, at this rate of gamma times i. If you solve this set of differential equations, this is what the, uh, what the sample paths look like. So if you start from a uh, a, you know, a small number of infectious people, uh, non-zero, but sort of uh, quite small, then the, the number of infectious people will rise at first, you know, at an exponential rate when the fraction of susceptible people is small. And then as the fraction of the susceptible population drops, um, each new infectious person uh, is able to infect a smaller number of the existing susceptible people. And so uh, the rate of growth of uh, infectious population slows. It reaches a peak here um, and, then it, and then it drops. Uh, and then you know, we see here that we reach uh, this um, you know, sort of level of, of herd immunity with which with, for the parameters on this graph that I stole from Wikipedia, uh, is, is quite large because the, the number of susceptible people left over at the end is almost zero. And you note that this graph from Wikipedia looks a lot like the graph that I just showed you from our Python simulation. Even though our Python simulation is doing more complicated set of dynamics, it has stochasticity in it. Uh, but, you know, essentially the law of large numbers um, 
coupled with the fact that the that the the simple model that I just described to you is a good approximation for the more complicated um, uh, Python model, means that you know if you understand what should happen in these SIR differential equations then you mostly understand what will happen in the more complicated simulation model. And then hopefully if everything is well calibrated, that gives you a reasonable understanding of what's going to happen in reality. Oops. So you can use the SIR model in order to understand when an epidemic is going to happen. When are you going to see this exponential growth? So just recall that beta is the number of new infections created per day by each infected individual in a fully uh, susceptible population. And then remember that, it, uh, uh, that an infectious, the infectious period lasts for um, one over gamma days on average. So then um, if you think about just taking the expected number of people infected during that infectious period, if everyone else is susceptible, you end up getting just beta times one over gamma. So that's, that's this quantity. And we call that, um, we call that R naught. So it's the, the expected number of other people that you're going to infect during the course of your, the, the course of your infectious period in a fully susceptible population. And the claim is that an epidemic will happen in this SIR model when, uh, when R naught is strictly greater than one. So when each new infectious uh, individual infects more than one other person. You can see that from the differential equation here. So remember that the rate of growth of the infected people uh, is given by this quantity. Um, plug in S naught is equal to one. That's the value for S naught that's gonna make the rate of growth of the infectious population as large as possible. In that setting, you can just rewrite um, I dot as being, you know, beta minus gamma times I, and then you can just do a little bit of algebra and realize that this is uh, gamma times R naught minus one. And so as long as this coefficient is strictly positive, you're gonna see, when you solve this differential equation for I, you're gonna see exponential growth. So, um, so this is gonna grow to an epidemic if R naught is strictly greater than one. Now, that's in a world without contact tracing. I said that in the general population and also at most other universities, we are doing, you know, we're doing contact tracing. So there's a simple way to augment this SIR model in order to account for that. So you can think about modifying it just a, just a hair. So let's imagine that there's an additional parameter alpha and um, and alpha is the rate at which people move from being infectious but not having self-reported symptoms to reporting their symptoms to the healthcare system uh, for contact tracing. So what I'm gonna do then is I'm gonna define gamma prime. So that's gonna be the rate at which people recover without reporting symptoms. I'll get this flow of gamma prime times uh, I into the recovered or removed um, compartment. And then I'm also going to define capital N to be the number of new, new positive cases that I find from each contact trace. I'm going to imagine that that's done instantaneously, although in practice, uh, of course, there's, there's, a, there's a delay in time. So that's going to mean that the rate of flow out of here is, so first of all, it's the people self-reporting symptoms, alpha times one, uh, plus um, there's an additional rate of alpha times n from the, uh, from the people removed from, from contact tracing. Okay, and you can, you can take that little compartmental model and you can do the same kind of algebra that I showed you for the SIR model without contact tracing. And you find that we're going to get epidemic growth um, as long as this quantity um, is strictly positive. So this quantity, uh, we call it the effect of R naught. And the way that we think about it is it's the, the net number of um, secondary free infections that result from each primary infection. So what is that? It's the, it's the R naught, it's the, the number of secondary infections that result. And then we get to subtract off the number of people that are traced by each self-reported 
infection times the fraction of infections that that self-report. So that this is this is n, and then this quantity here is alpha uh, over alpha plus gamma prime. And if you want, you can derive that formally uh, from from the differential equations that I showed you um, that are implied by what I what I showed you on on the previous slide, plus just a little bit of algebra. Right, and so you can also think about that diagrammatically, where uh, this was the case that self-reported. Um, these were the secondary, or this one, this was the secondary infection that was removed from a contact trace. Uh, there were three other people infected in total, so R0 was, was three uh, minus one, so the effect of R0 is two. So because that's bigger than one, we're gonna see epidemic growth in this uh, version of the world. So unfortunately for us, contact tracing isn't good enough on its own in order to control COVID-19. Um, if you take estimates of R0 from early in the pandemic before people were following social distancing mandates, you know, an estimate, and estimates vary quite a bit, but uh, the CDC's best estimate is that it was 2.5. Um, if you do a little bit of algebra and assume that, for example, in the general population, roughly say 65% of people are symptomatic, that, that may be actually a little bit optimistic. Um, and you also assume that all symptomatic cases seek care, then you get an effective R0 of, um, of this, 2.5 times 0.65 times the number of people traced uh, per report. So that would mean that in order to get this number below one, you need to have a, uh, you need to be able to find a really large number of contacts uh, in each contact trace. So, you, you know, you need to find most of the contacts. So what that means is that if you don't believe that you can find this many contacts in each contact trace, which you probably can't, then that's why we need to rely on, in addition to contact tracing, compliance with social distancing and masks, which reduces this R0 number. And in a college campus where you're worried that, first of all, this number is larger than in the general population, and number two, compliance with social distancing and masks is lower than in the general population, you should worry that contact tracing plus uh, you know, social distancing mandates may not be enough to control pandemic on a, on a normal college campus. So that brings me to what we're doing at Cornell that allows us to be different. So like other universities, we're, uh, we're testing students on arrival. Maybe unlike other universities or unlike some universities, like we're, we're really doing this. There was some publicity around um, some things that didn't go as planned in the, or in the early part of the arrival. But nevertheless, the fraction of students that were tested on arrival, well, the fraction of students tested on arrival, you know, and that had essentially no interaction with other people um, from arriving into Ithaca until they got the negative test result is, is quite large. Um, we test students with symptoms. We also test students without symptoms. So undergraduates are tested twice per week. Um, most graduate students are tested once per week, and then uh, professional, you know, in the professional and the graduate student population, there's some people that are that are tested more frequently than once per week. So we call that asymptomatic screening. The other thing that we do at Cornell is so, in addition to traditional contact tracing, we do what we call adaptive testing, which expands the scope of traditional contact tracing. We might find someone who uh, lives in a fraternity. Um, that person may, according to the health department definition, not actually have come in close contact with anybody in that fraternity. Maybe, um, maybe that person was somewhere else uh, over the last couple of days, and that person um, didn't spend very much time in the fraternity. And so the health department might say, well, other people in the fraternity are not close contacts. The Cornell Adaptive Testing Program uh, would perhaps, you know, based on clinical determination, decide to go ahead and test everybody in that fraternity. First of all, because uh, there may still have been exposure, even if it didn't meet the definition of a close contact. Um, and number two, uh, that person 
may have gotten the infection from someone in the fraternity, and the fact that they have it may indicate that there's uh, that even if even if the known case did not infect anyone else, it may still indicate that there's active virus in that subpopulation. Now, this requires us, or you know, in order to do this, we have to be able to do a massive number of COVID-19 tests, and that's enabled by uh, three things. So one is a really large capacity to do PCR-based tests for virus at the College of Veterinary Medicine. And that exists because it was in the old days, pre-COVID was used for, for example, for testing dairy cows uh, in order to prevent epidemics in, in that population of animals. Second of all, something called pooled testing, which is a really important part of our strategy, but I'm, I'm not going to have time to talk about, where instead of uh, running each sample individually in its own PCR reaction. You combine the samples together. You combine five samples together, run one pooled test. If it comes back negative, then that's highly suggestive that all of those individuals are negative and you don't need to do, uh, you don't do, need to do anything further. If that pool comes up positive, then you would go in and retest those samples in order to figure out which one contributed uh, to the positive result. And finally, the collaboration with the uh, local hospital and the larger um, healthcare body in, in, in which it belongs, Cayuga Health Systems, which organizes, uh, which has been a partner in, um, in all of the IT infrastructure for, for being able to do this at scale. And also has done a bunch of PCR and also sample collection and uh, just has been a great partner. So what are these things? So adaptive testing, right? So contact tracing is performed, but some of the contacts may have been missed. So adaptive testing would go ahead and identify the whole social circle of the index case and uh, would hopefully identify those additional cases that were missed in contact tracing. And I should say that, you know, college campuses are especially, an espe you know, I don't know if adaptive testing is going to be as productive in the general population where the health department usually operates, but it's, uh, we believe, a really good idea in, on college campuses where health services knows a lot about the social circles of the population whose health it's, it's trying to safeguard. It knows these links, right? It knows that like these two people, right, were both on the basketball team, right? And it knows that these people, uh, you know, sing together in the glee club. Second of all, asymptomatic screening. So what we, what if we miss somebody in, in adaptive testing, right? So we didn't know about, uh, about these links. So what we do, right, as everyone knows, is everybody gets assigned a collection of testing days and undergraduates are screened twice per week. So the people in blue here in the blue squares, those are the people that we screened on Monday. Okay, we didn't find any positives on Monday. Then on Tuesday, we, we found this individual and were able to quarantine them. Maybe this individual in, you know, on Monday would have infected somebody else, so it's not foolproof and we need to rely on, you know, continued screening and, 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 uh, and, adaptive, uh, and, and adaptive testing. But nevertheless, um, uh, being, having these two interventions available to us really is a very powerful tool for being able to control the epidemic. You can understand this, so we, we, you know, we, we understand this in our Python simulation, but it, you know, it's really important to get a good mental model for what's going on. So you can understand this with differential equations. What we're gonna do is we're going to add to the rate at which people move from infectious to this other compartment, and we're gonna expand the scope of what, um, of what this compartment means. It means either you recovered or uh, you've been isolated via screening. And I should say that just for simplicity in this analysis, I'm not including contact tracing, but you can merge together uh, the contact tracing kind of differential equation model that I showed you and this, which is going from the SIR to include screening. So um, T is the rate, is the fraction of the population that we are testing per day, right? So maybe that's like, you know, if, if, if we're screening everybody once every four days, then this is, 0.25. And if you do the same kind of algebra that we did before, you'll see that we'll get control over the epidemic as long as 
Now beta over gamma plus T is strictly less than one. That's the effect of R naught. So if you plug in um, the parameters that I was using before, uh, what you see is that in order to get epidemic control, you know, um, if you assume that one over gamma is let's say 10 days, you need to be screening on the order of 15% of the population per day. So that's screening everybody once per week. Now, in order for that to be safe, um, we need to have gotten our parameters right. And if we, let's say, overestimated this or underestimated beta, then it might be that once per week is actually not safe enough. So, um, you know, two times per week is, is safer than once per week. And that's why undergraduates are screened um, twice per week, even though, you know, our initial model said that it might be enough to do maybe once every five days. Here's some results from our Python simulation so showing the difference between asymptomatic screening and, and not doing asymptomatic screening, showing a histogram over sample paths of the, um, the percentage of the population infected, and we see a dramatic benefit from, from doing asymptomatic screening. We also do, uh, in our analysis, a great amount of uh, sensitivity analysis because the parameters that we use in our estimation, um, especially at the time that we were making decisions about, about reopening and about the design of the testing policy, were those were uh, um, highly uncertain. So we had three uh, scenarios um, for different, different parameter estimates, nominal, optimistic, and pessimistic. And we spent a great deal of time thinking about sensitivity um, of our predictions to different parameters inside of our compartmental simulation. Um, I'll, I'll say that, you know, you'll note that, for example, research-based graduate students are screened once per week and undergraduates are screened twice per week. Why is that? Well, it's because we believe in the data support that the rate of transmission in the undergraduate population is larger than in the graduate student population. You can understand that with differential equations um, by thinking about a model like this, where we have um, different susceptible compartments for each of our subpopulations. For example, undergraduates in high density housing, undergraduates in low density housing, graduate students doing research, gradu you know, graduate and professional students taking classes, faculty and staff who are student facing, et cetera. And there's a, a rate uh, at which people move from being susceptible to infected in each of these subpopulations, which first of all is proportional to the fraction that are susceptible in that subpopulation. Um, and then uh, there's a term which represents infections from other people in the same subpopulation. Okay, so that's, um, I'm, I'm going to now define a matrix beta. And so it'll be uh, the diagonal entry in that matrix corresponding to that subpopulation multiplies that number of infectious people. But then there's also off-diagonal uh, infections resulting from off-diagonal interactions, where um, there's a rate at which people in sub, the rate at which people in subpopulation two uh, interact with and infect people in subpopulation one. So I'll take that, uh, that coefficient um, and that, that will result in this term here. Um, and then I, you know, have something similar for the second population and subpopulation, and and, um, and then people move from the uh, from from the corresponding compartment of infected people to a recovered or isolated state um, at a rate uh, that's influenced by the testing frequency for that subpopulation. So here's the differential equation um, that just generalizes what I talked about before, uh, where now i is a vector. Um, this is a matrix, and you know I can potentially have a different rate of recovery for for each of my subpopulations. For example, if the faculty staff um, population has a different demographic in terms of age than the undergraduate population, then you can you know figure out what conditions do I need so that this equation does not result in exponential growth. If everyone is susceptible, um, the rate of growth is this thing, and so what I need is I need the all the eigenvalues of this particular matrix in order to be negative. So you can think about um, 
if one of the eigenvalues is positive, then I'm getting exponential growth along sort of one dimension um, of this, you know, of this matrix differential equation. And I need to increase uh, one of the TIs or a collection of the TIs in order to prevent that from happening. The simplest case, which is also kind of what we see in practice, is that the beta is mostly diagonal. And so that just corresponds to the condition that, um, you know, the testing frequencies for subpopulation I is large enough uh, in order to, in order to um, make this happen, which is the same thing as the effect of R0 for that subpopulation being less than one. So that's really helpful for us in sort of setting up simulation optimization in order to actually choose the screening frequencies. This is a graph that Alif made on the modeling team where we um, enumerated a, a collection of different uh, test frequency assignments. So for example, B here is one of the test frequency assignments. That means that undergraduates in high density housing would be tested twice per week, um, off campus staff and faculty once per month, and then everybody else once per week, right? And we define a, a, a large collection of these different kind of test frequency assignments, use our Python simulation in order to evaluate them all, and then trace a Pareto frontier over number of infections in the campus population over the course of the semester versus the test capacity that we would need in order to be able to achieve that. And then this was a key part of choosing the, the strategy that we're actually pursuing. Um, here's some simulation results with adaptive testing. We see that um, this is also, you know, an, an important uh, infection control strategy, especially if the rate of growth, uh, even especially if transmission is large enough that you're getting a significant amount of spread um, without this uh, intervention. Okay, so maybe I'll talk for maybe three or four minutes about how we got here and then have some questions. It's only been since April that we've been working on this, but it feels like longer than that. We, we got involved, I got involved um, along with Massey and Ugia, two members of the modeling team, because we were interested in pooled testing. We wrote a white paper about that, uh, that got some interest from um, actually the provost's brother, Larry Kotlikoff, who is a economist at Boston University, who wrote some articles about it in Forbes. Uh, and based on that, we started talking to the administration about using pool testing in order to provide asymptomatic screening, um, just in general and, and at Cornell. We were asked to serve on the university committee looking at this. And then we wrote a sequence of reports analyzing different aspects of this and, and answered actually a lot of questions. That was a big part of, um, a big part of what we did. Um, Along the way, we had a lot of uh, uncertainty about parameters. And so sensitivity analysis was really a critical part of, of what we did. And um, lack of knowledge of these parameters is what kept me from sleeping for most of the period that you saw uh, in, that, in that graph. This is just an example of you know, the kinds of things that we look at, looked at and, and um, worried about. So basically what you would see is like there's this trade-off between the, the amount of transmission per day that we think we might have in the, in the population and the fraction of the population that we're testing. And what we need to do is we need to like, we need to know what this is and then make sure that we have the ability to test like enough people so that we can be up and to the left on this contour plot. You know, so we, you know, we had kind of a reasonable range. And this is like, these numbers are really like in reality, actually we're kind of here, um, you know, but we didn't know at the time. And so th this was really important. Um, another part of what we did that uh, was important in decision-making and that, you know, I, I can talk about um, if folks are, are interested is, is the statement that residential instruction is safer than virtual instruction, at least under a very wide range of parameter settings. And you know, the essential kind of um, way that the analysis plays out is that based on sort of uh, surveys and conversations with landlords, 
it seemed likely that at least a few thousand undergraduates were going to return to Ithaca, even if we didn't reopen. And it would have been really hard to mandate and enforce asymptomatic screening, um, at least at the frequency that we would have needed for that population. And so when you have those conditions, and if you also have a reasonably large amount of contact uh, among people in that population, then you get exponential growth in that virtual instruction population in Ithaca, which is really dangerous, um, both for them and for everybody else. Semester has started at a number of places. And so a natural question to ask is, were we right about that? Uh, you know, we, from a scientific point of view, I would love to know the counterfactual, what would have happened if we had um, closed Cornell? What, you know, what would have happened? And, you know, there's, here's sensitivity analysis of different parameters from that prediction. And, you know, there, there is sensitivity, um, mostly to the expected number of contacts per day, especially because, you know, we believe that we're kind of in here. Um, it is possible that maybe uh, if we had brought people back, there wouldn't have been epidemic growth because, um, you know, because uh, student populations have less contact than we thought. But, you know, anecd we're, and we're looking at this question, you, trying to use data, but anecdotally, here's a story about Michigan State University that's closed for classes that told everybody not to come to East Lansing, except for some students in the law school and a couple of graduate students doing um, research, you know, some populations like that, but told undergraduates to go home. But at least some undergraduates came anyway, and they're seeing hundreds of cases. This is um, data, and I, I, this is for the week of September 6th, and I understand that cases are, are um, continuing to be quite large uh, in, in the past week. Um, got a lot of questions. Uh, that was definitely an experience, sort of learning how to, to answer um, these kinds of questions. Um, I, I will say that, you know, those questions and a lot of concern from the community pushed us to make our models really conservative. And so as a result, the number of infections that we've seen are actually substantially smaller than even our most optimistic estimates. And let me just close by, by saying a couple of things that I learned about trying to do operations research that um, influences policy. So first, I think it's important to do whatever is needed to solve the real problem and not to worry too much about what paper you're going to write. Sometimes those things are aligned, but often they're not aligned well enough and, and you, you really need to focus on this if you want to do a good, a good enough job for it to matter. I talked about the, the importance of these differential equation models and other kinds of mental models. Um, it's good to have high fidelity computer models, but you want to also know in your head what they're going to do. A big part of what we did was communication with stakeholders in the university, talking to them early and often as we did the, the modeling and analysis and to, to use that modeling and analysis in order to respond to their concerns and to answer their questions. And also to try to, you know, as well as we could, although I think we didn't do, uh, you know, I wish we, we could, could, could do more, um, just to respond to questions from the community um, just because there's so many of them and it's such an important issue. And then finally, it's good to get lucky. Uh, the decision makers at Cornell are scientists. You know, our president, Martha Pollack, she's a computer scientist. Um, uh, you know, our provost is a scientist. And so when the people who are making decisions are used to thinking about data as a basis for those decisions, it really supports uh, the use of, of math and mathematical modeling. So finally, um, let me thank you all for your attention. And let me also thank you for, you know, not going to parties and uh, uh, wearing a mask and staying uh, six feet apart. This is the Cornell Music Department on the Arts Quad. I was there the other night wearing my mask and here they are practicing outside. And uh, uh, so I think that's great. So thanks very much. So thanks, Peter. Um, Fang Chi, I, I saw at some point you were on the list of participants. Did you want to take over to handle question time? Well, you could go ahead if you don't mind, because I saw Professor Jason. Anyway, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Sharon. Um, thank you very much, Peter. So um, it's great. I think it's a very timely talk, and, uh, and we still have, I think, that's the most well-attended seminar so far this year. <laughs> so is there any question or comments from the participants? Yeah, I have a question. Please. Um, what role does false positives or false negatives play? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so those are both really important and really different. The role, we were really, let me talk about false positives. We were really worried about false positives. You know, if the false positive rate is high, when, you ha when you're doing really frequent asymptomatic screening, then you risk putting people in quarantine, in isolation, right? You think they're positive. You risk doing that even though they're not positive. And so that's bad because that's, you know, that's bad for that individual. Also, you then have to do contact tracing and then their contacts go into quarantine. And right, so that, that's really um, problematic. We designed, so the pooling strategy that we were using initially, we would, you take an anterior and area swab from the nose, test in a pool. If the pool comes up positive, then um, we, we were planning to go and take an additional sample, a separate sample, uh, um, and then to run another, uh, so, th so that the, the two false positives would be independent from each other. So if you have like a 1% false positive rate for test one and a 1% false positive rate for test two, you know, or, or more like a tenth of a percent and a tenth of a percent, then a tenth of a percent squared is a relatively low number. So that's how we were planning to deal with that. But what we actually found is that the false positive rate, we believe from the, from the, from the single pooled test with the deconvoluted um, retest of the same sample is actually quite low. And we believe that because number one, the number of positives we find overall, um, you know, is like, uh, you know, it's kind of on the order of 0.2%, something like that. Um, so if you, so that puts an upper bound on what the false positive rate, if all of those people are false po are positives. Number two, the positives that we do find, you know, are linked to each other. And that's an indication that actually those are not false. Those are, those are real positives. So actually we're no longer doing that second um, independent sample. False negatives, um, so yeah, that's important, very important. What it means is that you miss, there's like an infectious, an, an exposed or an infectious person that you miss in the surveillance and it reduces the effectiveness of surveillance and means that you're relying more on number, number one, more frequent surveillance because the, the probability of a false negative varies over time based on the viral load of the individual. So there is a lot of value in retesting somebody, you know, three days later. Um, and also means that, yeah, we rely more, you know, a little bit more on the contact tracing and the adaptive testing because the contact tracing, if you're false negative, but then you infect somebody, then there's a reasonable chance to show up as a contact and then you'll get quarantined, quarantined anyway. So yeah, those are things we spent a lot of time worrying about and are important. Okay, thank you. I think we should want to Yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, I want to thank you for the absolutely wonderful talk on such a pressing local and uh, global qu challenge. And uh, uh, I went to Harvard and Dorfman during the Second World War, proposed yeah. pooling, which is a wonderful story. I always tell in my intro probability course, and then I'm, I make them work out the whole, whole probability of that. And I recommend that for anybody teaching probability because it's very simple and very, very effective. Um, but I, uh, as, as a wonderful job as you did, I want to challenge the use of calling it a Python model. I mean, okay. I have pencil models and pen models and paper models. And so there's something about your Python model that is not communicated by saying it was a pencil model. Oh, uh, in some sense. And Python is just a language. Would it right. Be yeah, maybe I should call it a compartmental simulation, stochastic compartmental simulation. Fair enough. Would you use the word active agent? Um, like an agent-based model? Uh, I think yeah. You had different people, and then you were keeping track of what box they were in. But not every true. box was the same, which would be a would look like the same thing. I think there's a fundamental difference that your box contains individual people with individual characteristics. The you know the the here I'll show it the. Um, We, the, the stochastic, maybe we should call it a stochastic compartmental model. The, the state of this simulation is the, our counts. Um, okay, it's actually a little more complicated. So it's counts of 
number of people and how long they've been in each of these uh, states because in this compartmental simulation, we actually don't assume exponentially distri uh, distributed, um, you know, like time and state, uh, unlike the SIR model. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm open to suggestions on what I should call, <laughs> what I should call this model. Distance model. Oh, what's that? Just called systems engineering model. Systems engineering model, indeed. It's a systems engineering seminar, and so it's the systems engineering model. I agree. I agree. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, I think there are there are two two more questions from the chat. Peter, would you like to take a look? And Andrew sure, is yeah. raising a hand. I think Randy and Pete both raise a hand as well. Right. So you okay. So go next. yeah, let me let me take this first question. Uh, oh, does the model? Let me. I'll take the second question first, and then I'll take the first question second. Um, how will you reassess the testing rate frequency given number of infections detected? Yes, we are uh, going to do that. Um, we've been talking about how to do that. Uh, there are, right, so we overestimated how much transmission there was. Um, we are hoping to do two kinds of calibration. So, you know, you can have like a prior on parameters and then you can have observations of outcomes and then you can do a Bayesian model calibration exercise, which kind of basically comes down to excluding parameters that uh, produced outcomes that are really different from what you observed. And we can do that both with Cornell data and with data from other universities on dashboards that have been published. Um, and that's a thing that I'm hoping to do subject to bandwidth and um, from the modeling team. The second thing is that there, we are collecting data from surveillance from, the, uh, um, from our asymptomatic screening efforts and, so, and also from contact tracing. And so you might hope that we can look at the number of, like the number of infected contacts that each person has uh, from the contact trace. Um, that's also data that I'm hoping to use in order to come up with, with revised estimates. Um, that data was collected for a public health need and is not covered under an IRB. And so before we would, if we, you know, before we go ahead and, and use that data, we need to make sure that all that that's figured out. So that's, um, that would be the next step on that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interest in, you know, I have a lot of interest in trying to go back and, um, and recalibrate. Let's see the other question. Um, does the model investigate the probability of sudden evolutions in the virus itself? <sighs> For example, changes in the infectivity rate, fatality rate, or even incubation period requirements. So that is a limitation of the model that we, we do not, um, yeah, we do not uh, study that. And I, I think that, you know, the population at Cornell is small relative to the population of infected individuals worldwide. Uh, so I would think of that as like an exogenous event that would be, you know, if it's gonna happen anywhere, it's not gonna happen here, it's gonna happen somewhere else and then it would travel. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't model that and uh, I really hope that, that that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, what else? Um, do, do you want me to answer questions on the chat? Yeah, why don't, yeah. Uh, Pete wants to ask maybe this. Pete and Andy. Andy, have you typed your question already, or Pete? I'd like to ask, but I, I can wait. Well, Peter, you decide. <laughs> Let's see, some of these questions I can, I can answer easily. So how readily does your approach extend to vaccination strategy? Um, you know, I mean, if, if we were, you could plug in to the Python model, you could plug into the systems engineering compartmental stochastic simulation model, the, uh, you know, fraction of the population that has been vaccinated. We could even perhaps give advice about, you know, targeting of vaccinate vaccines to subpopulations. Uh, a big part of the vaccination strategy is, tr you know, transportation and logistics manufacturing. We don't have any of that in the model. Uh, and also like game theory about governments and yes, we don't have any of that. So I guess we handle part of it. Um, let's see. 
will a recording a recording of this talk be available? I see that it's recording, so I assume it will be available. It is. It will be available. Um, we'll make sure it's. Uh, well, Peter, it's up to you to decide whether you want to make it as a content intended video, or it's public available. We could make it both. Yeah, I, we can. We can make it publicly available. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's typically what we do, but you know, yeah, yeah. that's all good. So, mm -hmm. uh, Peter, if you don't mind, I think I would suggest you, we sure. give uh, Pete Lop and Andy a chance because they've been raising hands okay. for a while. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay. Can I ask my, can, I, can you hear me? Can I ask my question? Yes. Uh, uh, this is a little orthogonal to your talk, but you're as close to the subject as I can ask it, which is it seems like, uh, Cornell, you have so much data and you have such good contact tracing that you have an opportunity to collect the kind of information that I see almost not in the news at all, period, yeah. which is the science of social distancing. So you just have a parameter in there and contagiousness, yeah. and then we just say wear a mask, stay six feet apart, and then, they, and then everything is incredibly arbitrary, national, national policy, international policy. On the other hand, if you're doing such detailed contact tracing, you could do things like every time you do the contact tracing, you find all the people that are that and look at all the distances and see who comes out positive, who comes out negative and learn. Are there correlations with masks, different kinds of masks, indoors, outdoors, amount of ventilation, sex, no sex, wearing glasses, not wearing glasses, uh, you know, all the things that we just have rumors and intuitions about. Uh, you at Cornell or us at Cornell seems like you have an incredible opportunity for data collection which would be collecting, you know, like just today, there was a article in the paper about just wearing glasses make a difference. And it was just sort of a pathetic article about one anecdotal case. And then, and we're still reading about the restaurant in, in Hong right. Kong from, from March, you know, right. uh, whereas you could have so much data of that type to figure out about the science of social distancing, washing hands, not washing hands, all this stuff. Is that, is that, I know it's not quite your department. It's not in your models. It's just a, you just take a lump parameter for, right. uh, for contagiousness. But is that, is that something that is happening or could happen at Cornell? It seems like it'd be a huge societal contribution if you uh, worked at that. Yeah. Okay. So, is that clear? Yes, it is. I agree. I think it is a big opportunity for us. We, there are limitations to what we can know because it, you know, the contact tracing data that we have does come from interviews and the, you know, those interviews are sort of necessarily um, imperfect. Uh, but well, the thing is, is, there's a lot of, un, I mean, there's a lot of social science that's not controlled double blind experiments. Sure. <laughs> and so you're not in the double blind for sure, clean science, but, so we are, but let me tell you some things that we are, and, and so kind of we're doing it anecdotally, like, or sort of with our minds rather than with our computers, uh, where, you know, the, we review contact tracing data and then we talk about, and I'm just kind of like the data guy on the fly on the wall, but the public health people and the nurses and the physicians um, and the administrators in Cornell Health, um, we talk about this. And yeah, I mean, we see that number one, uh, living in the same household with somebody seems to be the primary risk factor. Um, a, attending class with someone does not really seem to be a risk factor. Uh, attending off-campus parties uh, with other individuals in the same social circles without you know, adult supervision, that does seem to be a risk factor. Uh, living off off campus, and this goes to like the um, uh, the thing I mentioned at, at Michigan State, and just like the general concern about not reopening. It, all, transmission seems to happen off campus. Like the on campus environment seems to be sort of well controlled enough that there's not a lot of transmission happening there. Uh, yeah, and so I do agree that like once we get you know if we can get an IRB figured out, then maybe even we can talk to. Um, our contact tracers and ask for like a little bit of extra data along a particular line. But I do can I, think- can I ask one, one little detailed yeah. question. In that off-campus transmission, any correlation with masks or no masks? You know, so you ask, I, I don't know, that would be a thing that maybe, I would, you know, like correlation is not causation. So it does seem to be that off-campus transmission is correlated with lack of stated lack of compliance with mask wearing, but also like you're also not really allowed to 
you know, have social gatherings of more than 10 people, um, right? That's also not allowed. And maybe the kind of people that don't comply with the mask requirements are also the kind of people that don't comply with all the other stuff and it's the other stuff that's the problem. Cool. There was another question from somebody who had their hand up. I think Pete, Peter, why are you going to ask a question? Oh, it's just me. Peter, we cannot hear you. Your microphone is probably a bit far away from your mouth. I can see he's speaking, but we cannot hear you. <laughs> I don't see him on my screen. Oh, he is. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, if you move the microphone down a little bit, that would be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we cannot hear you. I mean, another option is, would you mind just type, type in the chat? That could probably be easier. And Peter, you get quite a few other questions. I see Shen is working very hard to help you. <laughs> oh, I appreciate that, Shen. Thank you. <laughs> but um, there are a couple of them, I guess. Uh, it would be helpful if you're going to take a look. I think there's one from Cassie. Uh, okay. In particular. You mentioned a number of circumstances and resources that enabled Cornell to put this comprehensive mm -hmm. program in place. Clearly not every university can do this. What have you learned that is most broadly actionable to allow other schools to make their own luck? Um, yeah, like one thing is to have a giant lab that runs a lot of PCR. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to just pull out of thin air. <laughs> um, I do think that the if you don't have that capability, then this adaptive testing thing that we're doing is, I think, a really good way to be able to get some reasonable epidemic control without have, without requiring a really huge test capacity. So I, you know, I was talking to some folks at Virginia Tech, for example, the other day about their situation. And, and I was recommending that they think about trying to, trying to be able to take advantage of that. Um, yeah, and then the other thing that we're doing that, you know, it's just like everyone is working really hard. Like the lab, I was talking to folks in the lab just at 11 before this, and they, sh you know, they start deconvoluting the rest, yesterday's pools at 6.30 a.m. and they finish up around 11 or they send an email around 11 p.m. with uh, results from that day's lab tests. Uh, and that's, that's not just one day. Like, okay, they, they, on weekends, they only work like six hours or seven hours, but that's five days a week. Um, so just like a lot of hustle is a big part of this. How many tests per day? It's about... Um, uh, so originally it was about 4K per day, and now it is like 6K per day, and then on weekends it's kind of like 3K. Yeah, so here, like on Monday, they ran 6, 6K. Uh, so it's, they, they kind of increased test capacity a little bit, so they've been running about 5 to 6K tests, and then they want to go till, they want to go to 7K. That's, that's the hope. Um, Let's see, Mark Eisner asked me about uh, array testing. So square array testing is a fancier pooling method. Um, and so we decided that actually, you know what, the, the throughput limiting thing is opening, is the sample collection and also opening tubes. There are humans that open 6,000 tubes a day. Um, you can imagine like, you can imagine that. So we're trying to get a tube opening robot, but that's a couple of weeks out. So the, yeah, so the, actually the, the actual time in the PCR machine has not yet been the limiting, the throughput limiting factor. So the decision was made to try to keep it simple. And so we're doing like the vanilla Dorfman style pools, single, single stage hierarchical design with pools of size five. Yeah, uh, pools of size five. Anything else? I don't know, maybe Shane answered a bunch of these. Do you have, are there? No, I mean, I don't see any. Oh, there's one more from L, George. Okay. How much would you know was from the Python model? Oh, I would say that, I don't know if Shane, maybe Shane, you can say if you agree with me or not, but I would say that everything that we did that was important 
uh, we vetted via, yeah, definitely via the, you know, compartmental stochastic simulation, um, but also like we understood it intuitively and understanding it intuitively, yes, was, was this um, different, you know, differential equation model and, you know, kind of other mental models that we all had inside of our heads. And, you know, I don't think we, we would not have put a number I would not have put a number, you know, in front of the provost or the president that I didn't understand what, why it was like that number. If, if I could just add one thing, I think that, that your point about the differential equations giving intuition is absolutely right. We knew the direction. We didn't really trust the, the magnitudes of the predictions. And that was really what we were getting from the simulations, the, the quantitative versions of the answer. That's right. Can I ask a couple of questions, Peter? It's very interesting, uh, if you don't mind. So sure. the first question was that how these models will be kind of applicable to other institutions? Because, uh, you know, last week we had a speaker from Applied Mass uh, seminar program that we invite another person from a smaller college to present their model. And every model is different, right? Yeah. <laughs> like the right. environmental model useful that someone would just update the data and then use it for, you know, Cornell, yeah. maybe Yale, or Princeton, or Harvard, et cetera. But, I mean, you know, what do you think? Because there are so many different models out there. And, and how would you comment on these? Um, yeah, I think our model is useful at other universities. There have been some folks at Wisconsin who I understand have been using it heavily and it's up on GitHub and I, you know, other people are, are using it too, is my understanding. Um, yeah, like all the models are different and they end up focusing on, like, I think, I think that our model is better than some of the other <laughs> models out there just like Pareto dominates. But then there are other models that, you know, like don't do one thing that we do, but then do other things that we don't do and, and do it reasonably carefully. Like one example is that Ed Kaplan at Yale has a really lovely model that thinks really carefully about the, the fact that the infectivity varies over the age of the infection we just have this simple like no infectivity and then it jumps. So his model thinks about the time varying infectivity and also the time varying um, false negative rate. And uh, so, and that actually sounds like kind of nerdy and detailed and like, could that really matter? But I, you know, we spent a lot of uh, time worrying about, you know, like what, what is, how bad, it, we're not handling that and how bad is that? Uh, so yeah, that's an example of, um, you know, and I think that if you had, like, if this was Lockheed Martin and we were designing something and we had like a five-year time span, I think what we would do is we would probably recommend that you use like five different models developed by different groups in order to make predictions and like kind of ensemble the, ensemble the predictions and understand why the predictions are different. And if we had had more time, then I, I think we probably would have done that. That's great. Thank you. Um, the other question, which is more technology oriented, because um, I heard that UIUC, for instance, they have a different yeah. testing system, right? They use the, instead of putting in the nose, I think they just get something from the mouse. So, so how I, would yeah. you expect these kind of new testing technologies? Let's say at some point we could do that at Cornell. Um, how would you expect these new testing technology to change the whole landscape and the outcome of the, you know, the whole situation? Yeah. Um, so... The one big advantage is if you can do at home collection, you know, we're doing like observe, you go into the test site and the sample is taken and then someone observes you taking the sample. Um, if we could go to a place where you, we did talk about saliva, we, you know, we sort of felt that saliva would have been easier as a sample collection method and perhaps could have been easy enough that students could do in their dorm room and could, maybe it would be observed over Zoom um, or, or maybe they would just do it. And if you can do it at home collection and then have somebody go around and pick up all the tubes, that probably opens up like even bigger throughput. So that I think would be a big win. Um, all the, but we worked, the folks at the lab worked with saliva and decided that as a material, it was hard to work with. And so we ended up um, moving away, because you can do saliva-based PCR. Uh, we decided to, or they decided that it wasn't working as well. And so we went with the, the front of the nose. 
also there's kind of the speed of if you can you know pcr takes a little you know a couple hours so if you can get like a rapid test then especially for somebody that's symptomatic and you're going to ask them to quarantine around flu season then if you can get like a 45 minute test result i think that uh is really a lot better for the individual because they don't they don't have to quarantine for a day so that feels like a big win also anything that reduces false negatives um, our false positives are good, but, you know, I think false negatives are real. And if you can reduce false negatives, that's, uh, that I think also would be a third um, kind of big win. Thank you. This is great. It's good to know. Um, I guess we are kind of quite a bit of over time. <laughs> um, but I know it's quite, um, you know, the audience are quite serious. Is there any other last minute question that you would like to ask? Pete or Shen or anyone else from the COVID-19 modeling team. And David's here as well, I see. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Well, I was with him just now on the QEZM committee. <laughs> Sorry, I was a bit late. Um, it's like, quiet. All right. Okay, well, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you very thank much you. for a great one for a great presentation. We are great and very honored to have you here. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we are going to post the video on the internet so that everyone could uh, view it again if you want. Thanks, everybody. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.